Welcome back to A Year of Final Fantasy, and here we are, we're at the final episode of Month 5, sending off Diablos himself. And now we get to talk about the one and only Final Fantasy V. In my view, it's probably the last of the classical era Final Fantasies. So as always, these big Final Fantasy games at the end of each month are usually a little bit longer than most of my regular episodes, and that's fine because they deserve all the time that they need so I can get the information out to you and we can talk a little bit about it. First, we're going to talk about some of the release information, which is really interesting to me. Then we'll go into the jobs and the overall job system, which is really what this game is about. We'll cover what we've talked about so far and cover our remaining jobs that we have yet to discuss. Finally, we'll talk about the story, what it's come from, what we're going to, so let's just go ahead and dive into Final Fantasy V. Final Fantasy V is another one of those rare games that never got an initial release here in the States. So, yay, no explanation of silly number schemes. Well, actually, those numbering schemes going from 2 to 3 subverted the attention completely from gamers over here due to the fact that they didn't even have any idea, just in a casual sense, that there was even a Final Fantasy game between 2 and 3, which was actually 4 and 6 over in Japan. So, hey, I didn't get away from it completely, but it's something to note. So, like I said, for the average gamer, no one was the wiser about Final Fantasy V until the PlayStation came out. Then in 1999, along with the re-released Final Fantasy VI, which was properly named, we also have our first release of Final Fantasy V, at least officially over here. Similarly to Final Fantasy III, the real Final Fantasy III, if you were savvy on the internet with ROMs at the time, there came a fan translation. It's particularly interesting because the fan translation, our main character had the name of Butts, B-U-T-Z. Of course, during the official release, we have our hero by the name of Bartz. It's a much better improvement than Butts, B-U-T-Z. After the game did release, there were a bunch of ports, as you've seen with the other Final Fantasies. The Game Boy Advance version got a port on the Wii Virtual Console, the Anthology version came back to the PlayStation Network, and similarly to the older Final Fantasies, and Final Fantasy V got a port to Steam, like we've seen Final Fantasy VI do, and we'll talk about those later. The Steam ports and the mobile iOS ports are... they have a less than stellar reputation, but I'll discuss those in another video entirely. For Final Fantasy V, the director was Sakaguchi, the musician was of course Uematsu, you had the field planner Yoshinori Katasi, and the reason I mention him is there's some pretty interesting interviews out there with him, and he said this, talking about working alongside Sakaguchi. Mr. Sakaguchi and I worked on the games, events, in a relay. So when we would go to work, the first thing we would do is check the data of the other that they had put up to check the continuity. We'd see each other's work and think, hmm, I'll make something even better. It was sort of a competition. At this point, it seems that the team had been in a groove working with one another, and such that it could kind of be taken a step further, challenging their co-workers to not only create a game jointly, which is just a massive task in and of itself, but at this point they were pushing each other to make the best game that they could make. Possibly the most interesting revelation that I came across whenever I was working on the research for this video is that there were a bunch of ideas that surfaced in Final Fantasy V that they worked quite extensively on but didn't make it into the game. Two of which are ones that may sound familiar with you if you're familiar with the other Final Fantasy games, and that would be that there is a ninja with a dog, and there was also mention of a gambler using casino items in battle. Although these two ideas didn't make it to Final Fantasy V as they wanted it to, it's interesting that they originated here because there's some of the most well-known things about the next game that we'll talk about next month in Final Fantasy VI. So let's talk about why the game was never actually released over here in the U.S. As our friend Ted Woolsey said, I mispronounced this name last time, it is Woolsey, not Woosley. Final Fantasy V was deemed too complex for us Westerners. You see this actually come up a lot in the early days of gaming, late 80s, early 90s, whenever you're talking about games from Japan coming over to the U.S. to be localized. More often than not, they're dumbed down, they're easier, and in some cases, like with this and Super Mario 2, like the real Super Mario 2, they just missed us altogether. They thought the games were too complicated for us. At one point, Final Fantasy V was going to come over here under the name of Final Fantasy Extreme, but uh, that clearly never happened, because in 1990s, everything had to be extreme or awesome or whatever you want to call it. Some other little interesting tidbits that I found out was that in 1997 a rather large effort between a union of Square and then video game studio Top Dog 
which is almost impossible to find any information on. They were going to port the game to Windows. However, efforts and communications broke down. What's really amazing about this, though, is that during the very same time in 1997, we see fans working together doing what fandoms do. This is a perfect example of fandoms. So what we've got here was one of the first major ROM translations that came out. And of course, that translation was for Final Fantasy V. So where the legitimate companies failed to bring the game over to the masses, we have fandoms working together, no money, no pay for any of this, doing a translation so people could play the games that we never got. And I think that's so amazing. And it's really one of the first big efforts of a fandom like that. All right, let's get into the meat of the game, though. We've talked about the release, or lack thereof, exhaustively. So now we'll talk about the job system. And while jobs have always been in Final Fantasy, in Final Fantasy 1, they were introduced. Well, Final Fantasy 2, actually, they weren't in there. They were largely absent. Final Fantasy 3 is probably the most similar to Final Fantasy 5 in this way, but the characters largely, even in the remakes, I mean, let's be honest, they're pretty much blank slates. It's kind of like a Final Fantasy 1 put into overdrive. That was Final Fantasy 3. Final Fantasy 4, we almost had the perfect melding of character story integrated with classical jobs. And now with Final Fantasy 5, we have what could possibly be what Final Fantasy 3 aimed to be. Final Fantasy 5 does have a very compelling story and characters with motivations, but those characters are now not defined by their job. The job system is wholly separate as it was in Final Fantasy 3, and now we have deep character motivations that reflect the characters themselves, not the ideas or the professions that the characters are defined by. And that's not to take anything away from Final Fantasy 4. 4 is still one of my favorite games ever, but in this way, we're getting reflections of a characters as humans rather than reflections of characters in a particular profession. If so, let's go ahead and go over the entirety of the jobs of this game, the ones that we've talked about all through this month, then we'll catch up on the last few jobs we missed, and then there are a few jobs that show up in subsequent releases that did not make it into the initial release of this game. So to give just a very brief overview, these jobs are gained through elemental crystal shards. Minor spoilers here, the game starts off with a wind crystal shard shattering and those shards that the crystal shatters into bestow the abilities of these jobs. So I'll divide up the jobs by crystal here. Initially if you go back to the first video of this month I was going to do that but it just didn't happen like I wanted it to. But what I'll do here is go through these jobs crystal by crystal. And first off though, we need to acknowledge the crystal list job of freelancer, basically just a run of the mill person. All right, so let's start with the crystal of wind jobs. First off, we have the knight, who's a standard melee damage dealer. Next, we have the monk, who's a high damage dealer that really doesn't have any armor, but he does have a lot of hit points. We have the thief, who obviously steals things. Black mage, which casts offensive elemental black magic white mage who uses magic to heal and buff then we have the blue mage which is a little bit different you may expect the red mage but now we have the blue mage which can learn and use enemy attacks so next let's go to the crystal of water that gives us the red mage who's the jack of all trades black magic white magic physical attacks we get the time mage who's usually a support class and does some offensive magic as well we have the summoner which summons elemental beings we have the Berserker, who is constantly attacking with massive damage. We have the Mystic Knight, who uses magic to empower the weapons and attacks with elemental magics. And then we have the Mime, who can copy the last action, no matter what job that the ally uses or is using. The Fire Crystal jobs are next, and those are of the Beastmaster, which captures and uses those beasts similarly to a Summoner, although a little bit different. The Geomancer, who's a little bit of a wild card using the environment around him to cast different elemental spells. We have the Ninja, who can dual wield and is quite fast. The Ranger, who's primarily an archer that specializes in taking down flying creatures. And we also have the Bard. The Bard's a new class that we haven't officially covered this month, so that's what I'll do now. The Bard isn't a new class just in the general sense, we have seen a Bard before, but anyway, the Bard generally isn't a physically strong character or even magically strong. However, he does have the Sing ability which can affect groups of enemies or allies in many different ways. He's definitely a pure support character, and the premier weapon, of course, is the heart, thanks to the Spoonie Bard of Final Fantasy IV. Alright, so now we're gonna go to the fourth crystal. We have the Earth Crystal here, and those jobs are as follows. We have the Dragoon, who jumps and wields spears. 
We have the Samurai, who uses money to throw to gain incredible attack power or power himself up. The next two are ones that we didn't get to, so let's cover them now. The first we have is the Dancer. Now the Dancer is very similar to the Bard and actually is physically weaker than the Bard, so maybe not something you want to go on the front lines with. However, she does feel the support role as well just with various other abilities that the bard doesn't have, like granting multiple attacks, MP, HP drain. She's basically just another kind of bard. Next up, we have the last job that is from the original releases of the game, and that is the Chemist, who's actually pretty unique as far as jobs go. Now, this isn't going to be the last time we've seen the Chemist. They'll pop up in later games, but their shtick is this. The Chemist basically can mix different items and potions together, and then they can drink these to give themselves powerful stuff status buffs. And the chemist by itself is fairly weak, but using their drink ability combined with another job, they can actually be incredibly powerful in that respect. But the thing is, you have to level the chemist up first before you can give your abilities to another job to get that very large bump in power. So that is the exhaustive list of jobs here in the game that initially released. Now, re-releases have added four new ones, which are not given by crystals. They're found elsewhere in the game. I do want to go over those because they're pretty interesting. They're mostly a mishmash meld of other classes, and then they have their own spin to them. Now, I won't tell you how to get these jobs or anything, but I just want to make you aware that they do exist. First off, we have the Necromancer, who is very similar to the Blue Mage in the way that they learn their abilities, they call them Dark Arts, from enemies. The Necro feels like a combination of many classic classes, like I said, the Blue Mage, the Black Mage, Summoner, and maybe even a little of the Beastmaster. Necromancers do have a pretty large drawback in that they are inherently undead, which means that they cannot be healed with normal items. It actually damages them quite a bit. Next, we have the Cannoneer. This time, it's a mix a little bit of the Ranger, chemist and maybe even geomancer. The cannoneer deals normal physical damage from the back row, possibly dealing status effects. Later you can combine items to produce explosive effects while affecting all enemies. Next up we have the gladiator which is a little bit of an upgraded fighter in some respects like dealing damage and taking enemies out very quickly with precision. Their attacks do a ton of damage however their HP and armor are a little bit on the downside. Essentially it's a physical version of the glass cannon. In the last new job that we have is the Oracle, which seems to be a little bit of a combination of the Geomancer and the Mime. Their abilities of Condemn, which is one of their actions, is random in the purest of senses, and whichever target that you select, they're going to be either hit by an attack or possibly healed. Predict is based on the effects that the last person in the fight used. Again, it's slightly like Mime, but again, there's seemingly random effects. Now you can go online and see exactly what does what and all of that. People that have deconstructed the code of the game. But if you're just playing it casually, it can seem a little bit random. Whew. Okay, so that's it for the jobs. There's a ton of them. I think there's about 25 of them. There are a lot of them in Final Fantasy V, obviously. And just to briefly go over the way that the battle system handles them, basically each job has its own job level. And as you increase that level, you gain access to their innate abilities. If you switch jobs, you can actually use those abilities that you've learned from the other jobs and equip them to the jobs that you currently have. You can use the chemist mix ability if you're a fighter. So then you can drink stuff and make yourself like ridiculously powerful compared to a just regular fighter. And there's just thousands of different ways all of these jobs can interact. So it is very complex for a Final Fantasy game, especially for a battle system. And that very complex intricate job battle system is the jewel or you know dare I say crystal of the Final Fantasy V game. So finally let's get on to the story as well as talk about some interesting things that this game sets up going forward. Of course I don't go very in depth with the story. I think if you like this game you want to play it yourself I don't want to ruin that for you because Final Fantasy games are primarily about story. But there are a few things that I do want to touch on. First is that we return to our tried and true classic elemental crystal story. You all know obviously that I love that premise. It's what the channel is based on even though we're not a Final Fantasy channel proper. I do like this classical elemental story and it does deal with some pretty complex issues and you see those characters grow and develop in ways that are all on their own. Like I said it's similar to Final Fantasy 4 but I'd argue here these characters that we're journeying with have more personalities to grow with and expand in different directions unlike Final Fantasy 4. The issues that you're going to be dealing with during the story aren't just black and 
and wipe issues. There's a lot of gray space in here and challenges that do not have a right or a wrong answer. There's something that these characters are dealing with internally rather than just a blanket good or evil aspect. And you'll see this develop more and more as we get through these games, especially Final Fantasy VI, VII, VIII. This is going to be a core aspect to the stories going forward. Again, it did start in four, but here I believe that it expands on that and you're going to see it just blow up in the later games. Something that I really want to point your attention to, and I've never heard anyone explicitly call this out, though I'm sure they have or they have at least thought about it. We have the usage of a meteor as a very big plot point. Now we actually did see this in Final Fantasy IV in its infancy with Tella. Tella had to learn meteor. That was a big plot point. I won't say any more about it, but this game starts with this meteor crashing into the planet. Now this is something that's going to be expanded upon an incredible amount in later games, especially Final Fantasy VII. Final Fantasy VII is basically the meteor game. We've talked a lot about obscure and generally lesser known games here, and it's a fitting narrative throughout the month that I've dedicated to Final Fantasy V. Throughout this entire month of Diablos, we've talked about games that may not have had their time to shine. They've been swept under the rug, and I do think that that does apply to Final Fantasy V in some ways here. Final Fantasy V did add a lot to the series. It gave us Gilgamesh, which I've talked about in a recent video. It expanded more on the summons. It expanded on the job system that we'll see going forward. It's just sad that the game never really has embedded itself into the culture of Final Fantasy like the other ones have. It's still a fantastic game. I really wish everyone would go out and play it if they haven't because of the job system and how masterful that's done here. A lot of people dismiss it as being a rehash of older games like 1 and 3, and that's certainly the case if you're just seeing it from the outside, but whenever you do dive into the story, it does offer a lot more that we haven't seen in other games. It does have a bunch of twists, turns that you probably won't expect that's coupled along with an incredibly deep job system like I mentioned. Makes for a fantastic game that really will be the swan song, at least what I'm calling the classical Final Fantasy games. So, as we send off Diablos, we've reached an important milestone here in a year of Final Fantasy in that we're one third of the way through this insane insane project. I'm glad and very humbled by all the support and for those who want to help spread this video around, help out myself as well as a small community that we've created and I've been honored to have. Diablos is gone and now we look towards the month of June, the month of Odin. So for that let's send off Final Fantasy V in the proper fashion as we do. Thank you so much for watching.